Well, medicinal plants work best, not as a last minute intervention to back people down from really challenging health problems, but as an everyday continuous dose of certain compounds and constituents and nutrients that build up these foundational processes. Welcome to the show where we help you make smart nutrition simple. If you want proven nutrition strategies to help you build a better body and create the energy to show up for your family without overly restrictive and unrealistic dieting, then you're in the right place. Make sure to subscribe and enjoy this episode. From the shaker on your table to the herbs in your garden, plants are natural superheroes hiding in plain sight. Today, I'm excited to chat with William Siff, a renowned expert in plant medicine and the author of The Plant Medicine Protocol, Unlocking the Power of Plants for Optimal Health and Longevity. Bill is a licensed acupuncturist, clinical herbalist, ethnobotanist, and health educator who specializes in Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine. His mission is to connect people with the healing power of plants. In today's conversation, we explore how medicinal plants shape both ancient practices and modern medicine, debunk myths surrounding plant-based treatments, and offer practical advice on how to infuse these natural remedies into our daily lives for enhanced digestion, detoxification, hydration, sleep, and overall vitality. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Bill. Bill Siff, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show. What's good, brother? Thank you very much for having me, Ben. I'm looking forward to talking. It's an absolute pleasure. I have been consuming your your book, The Plant Medicine Protocol, uh, Unlocking the Power of Plants for Optimal Health and Longevity. And, you know, we were we were discussing before we jumped on, but dude, it's kind of like the Bible. I mean, it's it is a <laughs> uh it's really an impressive piece of of I'll call it literature for lack of a better term, but just in terms of the depth of knowledge that you have around plants and, and, and plant compounds and herbs and spices and the way that we can leverage these into our daily lives. Just so people don't get confused around the title, because the plant medicine protocol, I think perhaps people's minds might go to psychoactive drugs and, you know, mushrooms and ayahuasca and stuff like that. Give us a, a short descriptive of kind of what in, is entailed in this compendium of literature. Sure. Well, yeah, I can see the, the, the plants, obviously the word medicine, you know, denotes sort of something that people have a association with that they only encounter or reach for when they're ill. Um, this, this is sort of like in one way is a, an attempt to redefine the concept of medicine as it applies to specifically to plants being that you can initiate healing responses and enhancement of different physiological functions in the body every day constantly with these specific medicinal plants uh, or specific plants we call medicinal but they're not also the kind of medicinal you'd only reach for in a high powered supplement or just strictly for some kind of you know in some standardized form that is 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 addressing a um and targeting a complaint or a dysfunction primarily we're talking about in this book i'm talking about everyday medicinal plants that are more you could think of as like extensions of diet things that people have and continue to consume on a regular basis as sort of aspects of their diet and their cuisine or they're just like or, or just you know elements of their lifestyle that happen to be plants but they exist on a spectrum, you know, from like the, the nuts and the seeds and the vegetables and the fruits and the things that we eat every day as for our for macronutrients and, and for their micronutrients and for their like carbohydrates and for things like that. But medicinal plants in the context that I'm using in this book really are referring to the plants that um, exist on the far end of the spectrum and in, in, in meaning that we don't consume them so much only for nu- nutritional components and but for the secondary metabolites and the unique compounds and constituents that they create that give them their effects on our physiology 
And so, for example, when we consume something like ginger, there's a spicy taste, the gingerols and the different compounds that give us that pungency and, and initiate that feeling of warmth on our tongue and in our belly and, and extends to like um, accelerating circulation throughout the body. It's not something that we require nutritionally. You know, that's a compound that's like, you could say it's optional for the body, but from the standpoint of what that compound, the compounds that give you that, that physiological effect do, um, nothing else in our normal diet has that kind of compound in it or that kind of effect. And that's across the board, whether it's the different compounds in garlic or basil or thyme or oregano. But yet, if you saw these things, most of the time you'd see them on the table, you'd see them in sort of in a condiment or it's, so it's partly how we're applying them, how we're using them and what dosage we're using them and what right. frequency. That's the main thing. Yeah, no. And, and it was fun for me and interesting for me to have the opportunity to dive into your book um, I, you know, my background is, is training and nutrition. I have a master's degree in clinical nutrition and in my clinical nutrition studies, we, we spent a considerable amount of time, um, actually looking into, you know, plant compounds and phytonutrients and, um, actually looking at the research around a lot of these plant compounds and the effects of these you know, plant nutrients on health and well-being and from a medicinal component. And it's worth mentioning that so much of our Western medicine and, and just medicine in general is rooted, literally rooted in plant medicine. So that's part of why I, I brought this up originally is because I think there's like such a disconnect when we start talking about you know, maybe just the term plant medicines. And that's what I I'm, I appreciate you sharing and really am excited for our listeners to be able to better understand and hopefully leverage through your book because there's so many vital components to the spices and the herbs, right? And, and, and the plant materials and the foods that we use every day that go so far beyond just the macronutrients and just the micronutrients and just the components, especially with the context of like this podcast, when we talk about the role of food and body composition change and general health, like you're really rooting down into um, foundational health and well being and how you've leveraged these plant medicines to heal people. And, and I'm very interested in hearing. Um, what that looks like, what that has looked like over an expansive career for you. You mentioned in the book, uh, it, you have a quote at the beginning of the book, you said the shaker on your table is a superhero hiding in plain sight. And the reference was to black pepper and how every single household and probably every single country has black pepper available to them. And we use it sort of unknowingly acknowledging that that is one example of a spice that has an, a myriad of of benefits. And I think that's a good example of how there's so many other um, nutrients and compounds that have similar type of benefits that we use maybe to some degree, perhaps we have the opportunity to use a lot more. And that's kind of what I want to get into in this conversation. So Tell me um, what prompted, and you don't have to get into an extensive background, but but really what prompted your immersion into plant studies? Well, I mean, uh, so I've been I'm a, I've been practicing Asian medicine, specifically Japanese and Chinese medicine that includes acupuncture, nutritional therapy, various types of body work, um, Ayurvedic medicine, the traditional medicine of India. I have, that's my primary background in natural medicine. And I've been doing that clinically for over 20 years. Um, I've had an extensive experience with medicinal plants at, as the sort of like cornerstone of those practices. That was the, really the focal point and the doorway in which I would, I, I worked with patients and still work with patients is through the lens of medicinal plants, which are sort of like the, you know, the pharmaceuticals of natural medicine. Um, I've had medicinal herb farms that I've run. I've, uh, I, I practiced for many years in an, an establishment that I set up at an herbal pharmacy. And what that looked like was an extensive collection of medicinal plants in all sorts of different 
forms and preparations um, from everywhere in the world, like hundreds and literally thousands and thousands of medicinal plants, like a really great collection of them. And I set it up in a way that looked modern and, and uh, you know, trustworthy. It wasn't sort of like a throwback to yesteryear or like some kind of folk medicine. It was like putting it in its place the way I'd seen it in Asia, you know, cause, because in Asia, plant medicine is uh, using medicinal plants for medicine is often sh- is uh, shown. It shows up in pharmacies or what we consider to be pharmacies or apothecaries. So you just yeah. walk in on the street. And you can walk in and get remedies, patent remedies for different kinds of acute issues. You know, I got a cold, a flu, a stomach issue, and they're in boxes and there's pills and liquids and this kind of thing. And then there's a whole other collection of like loose and raw herbs that someone's formulating and and packaging up into a specific prescription that is to be delivered to a patient that one of the docs may be working in the back in, you know, rooms in the back aside uh, gave them or prescribed for them. So it serves as this quasi, this real public health institution, actually, that and, and dispensary for medicinal plants and medicinal plant knowledge. And it was really, to me, like, I liked that because it was really out front. You know, it wasn't sort of just hidden in a supplement aisle of a, of a Whole Foods or something like that, where someone might understand medicinal plants to, an, to a degree because they're either like interested in them and they're a hobbyist, but they're not a clinician most of the time. And so when someone comes in with a specific question or looking for some remedy, they might have questions that don't have the right answers in that setting and circumstance because the information available to that person might be, well, like, look at the bottle. The bottle says this, or you could try this. But as a practitioner, I could, through the setting up of an herbal pharmacy, people would walk in off the street and I would, you know, they'd come in and there's so much interest and and desire to, uh, to understand medicinal plants, but they're getting information off the internet or through different product companies and it's not always reliable. So they come in and they have a question and I can look at their tongue. I can quickly check their pulse. I can ask them a whole bunch of relevant questions. Like, so are you on any medications and when do these symptoms show up and what makes them worse or what makes them better or what, when you eat dietarily improves it or, or makes it worse or have you noticed any patterns? And now I can do all this in like, maybe 10, 15 minutes if there's nothing else going on and give the person a lot more direction and say, well, compared to what they might've walked in with, which might've been an unrealistic expectation. So what am I going to take? What what essential oil should I take to cure this, you know, this really troublesome disease? I'm like, no, that's not how it works. You know, this is, you you have to place medicinal plants in a context that includes diet, lifestyle, age, you know, weather, all the circumstances of life. And people like that because that gives them a lot of, you know, that's reliable information and, and, and starts to give them a sense of how to use this and this form of medicine in their daily life. And I'll, I'll just finish with like, so, so what got me into writing this book was over, over many, many years of clinical practice and both working with people kind of walking in off the street with public health kind of complaints, like, there's allergies going around, or I didn't sleep well last night, or I got food poisoning the other day, as well as treating people with more intractable or like, you know, challenging multifaceted issues that are like, you know, you, you see in a clinical practice, uh, chronic problems that don't lend themselves to just something off the shelf or a supplement. What I realized over a 20 year period was that, you know, everyone was kind of walking in with some similar etiology of their disease process or their dysfunction or their complaint. It always rests on the fundamentals, which I know you must know a lot about. and I'm sure you talk about all the time, but it's like sleep and stress issues, hydration or lack thereof, digestive issues, detoxification and elimination right. issues. You know, the fundamental like pillars that are the foundation of health, if they're not working well, then nothing anyone ever does from an intervention standpoint, whether it be dramatic with drugs and surgery or something that's like, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, that's like uh, cold plunges and saunas and, right. you know, yo- a yoga practice. It's like without those fundamentals, you're, you, you know, you're nothing works. So it's like, kind of always have to get back to these basics. And when I see that the ideology of these problems people are coming in with, that you know are all the same and later on down the road become chronic migraines or ibs or you know some really um 
challenging health issue. And, and, and what they're looking for from the medicinal plant world is something that could maybe replace a drug that's not as harmful, has less side effects, but works the same way for their symptoms. It became clear to me that actually what, what I started seeing is that, well, medicinal plants work best, not as a last minute intervention to back people down from really challenging health problems, but as an everyday, like continuous dose of certain compounds and constituents and nutrients that build up these foundational processes, such as, again, digestive capacity, ability to detoxify, ability to sleep and get deep rest and recuperation, handle stress and like balance the endocrine system. And and it's possible that like one of the things that's what I saw was so I'd, in between visits when I'd see people who had, you know, complicated issues, I'd send them, send them home with the tea and say, you know what, in between your visits, even though you might be taking this like high powered supplement to deal with your symptoms, just take this to strengthen it and, and, and improve the root functioning of some of your most important systems that have got you in here in the first place like your digestive system. Mm -hmm. And, and then they say, okay, so when do I, you know, stop taking that? Well, it's like, I say, never, you never stop taking that. That's like, you're not supposed to stop taking these things. You're supposed to constantly have them in your cupboard, in your tea cabinet, you know, in your backpack when you're traveling around because medicinal plants offer things that nothing else that we commonly consume does. And I would say, I would also submit that, you know, people, we evolved with these compounds and constituents that there's never been a time really in human history where we haven't had the range of antioxidants and special constituents and compounds that medicinal plants contain on a regular basis. As, and, and when you go and when I go and I travel all over the world to visit cultures that have enviable health and longevity, you know, so-called blue zone cultures, which exist all over the place, you know, they, they, they have a lot of things in common. They, you know, their, their, their diet, their exercise patterns, their, their community and social relationships, but they also all, as far as I can tell, and what I've seen and my and through my research, that they all include wild and medicinal plants in their diet as well, um, in some form or other, whether it's in their cuisine or as special teas and tonics and elixirs that they drink, which we can get into. Mm -hmm. um, but that I think what separates a lot, I, I think. So when I got to the point, I was like, you know, I don't think these medicinal plants that I'm talking about, these everyday medicinal plants, are sort of. Um, they're not optional in my my opinion now they're sort of kind of like a, a non-negotiable if you want to have a certain um a shot at a certain level of health you know because i just think we, we're in sort of a, a phytochemical deficit you know situation humanity you know we, we the the average person you know, one of our sort of like ancestors, not too distant in the past, would have a hundred different plants in their diet, you know, and the average American nowadays has less than 20. That means we're missing a lot of nutrients. We're missing a lot of phytochemicals because these things are what reduce inflammation. These things are what improve elimination and stimulate the different organ systems like the liver to pump out bile and remove cholesterol and, and, and toxins and um, accelerate hydration through uh, through through like gels and mucilages and and demulcency right. and feed the microbiome and so they're very special plants and they're and they're not so exotic and they're not so expensive that you have to you know that they they break the bank or anything like that and I think I'm going overboard in terms of answering your question but I guess kind of gone on a roll but you know that I'll just say to to, to finalize the answer to your question is like even though I still am a busy practitioner of natural medicine with a busy clinical practice i always really try to land on getting people the the sort of like tools and context understanding and education about how to really integrate medicinal plants into their daily lives so that they can take on an aspect of foundational health themselves and self-care themselves um that's what the book is all about and uh, that's kind of what my practice has landed on as the mm -hmm. kind of like the mission if you will um because it's really not evident that, you know, you probably travel quite a bit when you see certain cultures, like I, I lecture all over the place. And some people are like in our culture, like they're afraid of kind of like berries and barks and sticks and stuff like that. And in compare, you know, but, but there's sort of like no problem with sort of like, oh yeah, you know, I go get my NyQuil or my whatever. It's like, totally. we've gotten very comfortable with with a with a with chemical medicine but very uncomfortable with medicine that's 
pretty simple and rootsy and from the earth. It's not the case everywhere in the world. And, and, and so that's why I talk about it so much, because I think it, it makes a big difference from a public health standpoint and from an individual health standpoint to reintegrate this into our lives. Yeah, and I think it's very easy to to become removed from that mindset, from that daily integration, just with modern food practices, especially in the U.S., is we're just this melting pot of cultures that aren't really generally practicing this, the cultural practices that everyone came from. And it was very well spoken and, and articulated. The way you just broke it down, what I was hearing from you is that, you know, while we do have these plant medicines that should be integrated every day, in fact, you talk about your plant medicine protocol, which is variety plus consistency plus time equals elevated health. And I think we could apply that to so many different aspects of life. You're saying there's no one herb or spice that's going to be a panacea or fix any necessarily underlying condition is so much of it is lifestyle driven, which look, we talk about this all of the time, right? The stress we I, induce on ourselves. I, I want to touch on the, upon that thing that you just said, the variety plus consistency plus time. That element is so important because a lot of times people consider medicinal plants as sort of the weaker, younger cousin of say pharmaceutical medicine. It was outcompeted. It just, you know, it was good for a while, but then we discovered something else and it doesn't work. And that's actually not really the case. A lot of times it's really just about how we're applying it at what dosage range, right. what frequency, how consistently it's like, of course, like, for example, you know, in India, I was there sourcing uh, various things for the, for one of our, our companies, but Every, every time, if I don't know if you've been there, but constantly you're eating curry. You're eating like, there. well, you know, Indian food. I mean, it's, sure. it's and it, it, there's all a lot of curry. There's a lot of turmeric. There's cinnamon. There's ginger. There's all kinds of, for the most part, there's there's all those curry spices are in almost every dish in some ratio or another. Now, we we've heard some of the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant benefits of uh, of turmeric. We know that like. Right. And, and ginger and so on. And we know that inflammation is generally recognized as to be like one of the underpinning pathologies uh, of, of almost all chronic diseases related to some in some form or fashion to inflammation. So when you take a culture like that, where they're getting small incremental low doses of anti-inflammatory herbs in almost everything they eat, spices, I mean, um, over a day, a week, a month, years, it's like that's where the impact comes in. That's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. that's a simple. Now, of course, it tastes great, but there's also a real function behind it. And and so it's kind of like the idea is that like over time, those incremental little things we do build up into massive changes. It's like push-ups, you know. It's like it, it, it's like it's toning our body. It's giving our system little bits and doses of these compounds that have extraordinary effects. But you're not overwhelming them and asking someone to go out and get a $200 supplement of turmeric right. and take that. And then you take it for like a couple of weeks. You forget about it. It's in your, your cupboard. Oh, you're on a trip. I forgot it. So I forgot 100%. it for a week. Is it still going to do anything for me? And they come back. Should I even start it up again? And it's, so it's these habits that get back, you know, back to that black pepper analogy. It's like, well, there's always, these things are always hidden in plain sight. You know, some of them like make it through the, uh, the cultural kind of like defenses. And it's like, you can get black pepper on a, a, a cross-country flight, you know, on an airplane, you can get chamomile tea or peppermint tea in like a Denny's or, or a McDonald's if you really want to. It's like they're available to us. It's just reframing what we think they're going, their potency is. Now, another way to think about that is like, you know, if you take a little tea bag of chamomile and you dip it in a few times and you just put a little honey and it's like a little light cut, that might, in people's mind, it's like, okay, that's a mild little tasty, soothing thing. You take four tea bags and you leave it in there for 25 minutes and then you squeeze those tea bags out. Now you've got a dark, like really strong brew of something that is still very mild and very gentle in its like overall safety profile, its activity. But with that dosage, you could you could cure a stomach ache. You could really improve uh, like say gas and bloating. You can make space for the digestive processes to occur with the mixing and the churning and the extraction of nutrients and the secretion of digestive enzymes and stuff can happen in, in, in more uh, of an appropriate space. It turns, the, it turns the 
nervous system from fight or flight to rest and digest parasympathetic, which is what we want when we're digesting our food. All of those medicinal effects in just like little a few bags of chamomile tea when you make it that strong. Now, if you do that several times a week, now you're really, you know, or every day, you're going to start to change the status of your digestive system. And that is going to have really, really big impacts on your health over time. That's kind of what I'm getting at with this mm-hmm. formula that you just mentioned at the beginning. And I think that the daily practices really infuse kind of what you're talking about or what we're talking about around the lifestyle changes that are requisites to probably the healing process as well. You know, you talk about the blue zones and I'm sure all of the cultures that you've had the the opportunity to spend time with around the world. And we know, you know, in the in addition to including these plant compounds into their daily cuisine and, and lifestyles, they're physically active. They have a strong kind of sense of purpose and community. And, and obviously they eat healthier foods and stress management. And, and so what I appreciate about how you laid out the plant protocol, because and, and I would love to kind of share some tips with our audience in just a little bit about how to start to infuse these things on a daily basis, because that's really by virtue of giving yourself the opportunity to get hydrated in the morning and start to improve digestive functions and then, you know, um, facilitate detoxification and manage stress in the nervous system, right? Um, and, And what have you, those are all the components that really synergize to help us become, as you said, like help us facilitate this elevated health, right? Exactly. Yeah. Originally, you know, the the question from the publisher and my editor were like, so how do you do it in the clinic or how do you do it with actual patients? That's where the protocol came in because I had to sort of like, a lot of times that's, there's nuance involved with that when I'm working with people. I don't just walk in and say, here's your system. It's a, I work with them as individuals, but I I was able to like boil down common denominators and be like, well, you know, I have to do this because I'm trying to communicate something that's actually useful and, and can be, you know, uh, adopted and, and worked with in your daily life. So the protocol was about taking these, first of all, looking at these body systems that I've, I've mentioned before, and they're not all like systems, like physiological systems from the standpoint of what we learned in, in, or in phys- or some of us, but all of us anatomy and physiology class. Some of them are like, you know, when I talk about the endocrine system, Right. But when I'm, but some of them, when I talk about hydration, it's not really a system. It's just a, it's a function. It's a necessity. It's, it's, it's hard to define exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's a, um, it does, it, it does overlap with many of our body systems. It, re- all of our body systems require good hydration, but in and of itself, we don't call it like, what's the hydration system. Totally. Regardless, I identified five functions slash systems that w- were imperative and, and are the first thing. First of all, the first thing that I'm always like looking at and assessing with people, like, are these working well or not? And there are also things that we um, tend to self-assess a lot too. You know, you wake up in the morning, you think, how did I sleep last night? Or if you have a wearable, you're kind of like measure how you slept last night. Or you, either way, you think about that when you wake up, you're like, did I get enough rest? What's on my day, my docket today? Do I have the brain power for the meeting I have? Because I stayed up too late last night, I'm going to have to juggle some stuff to figure out how to deal with this day. And we're always self adjusting these systems or like working with them anyway, but the systems such as digestion and, and, and detoxification is kind of the other side of the coin of digestion, uh, hydration. I said, into you know, endocrine system, which again is really a lot about that is about sleep. I mean, sorry, stress, endurance, reproduction, fertility, um, libido, that's all kind of in the endocrine mm-hmm. system, uh, bucket and then nervous system health. Um, which again is really, you know, it's, that's where sleep comes in, but it also, you know, all the mood stuff, cognitive function, things like that. And many more things that actually go along with the nervous system. But so, so I start with these body systems and then I just link them with the particular categories of medicinal plants that address their health, that enhance their functioning, that improve them in some form. And then it's about how, if you understand, for example, culinary spices, well, when do we eat culinary spices? During culinary times, you know, they're part of our cuisine. So you don't usually think about like, let me eat a whole bunch of uh, fennel and coriander and oregano randomly in the middle of the day. 
they're always accompanying our meals. They're always in, integrated into the food, right? And there's a reason, of course, for that. Part of it's the flavor and the aroma, but it's also because their functions, whether whether those, we call them spices because they have that pungency, that warmth, that ability to increase circulation. So when we eat a spice, even when we smell a spice, we start to salivate more. Our digestive enzymes and the, and the hydrochloric acid and the gastric intrinsic factor and the pepsin and all the things right. that start to digest our food, they start to kick in in relation to the, the, the stimulus of that spice because it's, it's literally spicy. The essential oils and the other compounds in them increase nerve currents in our, in our gut, which starts to increase circulation. Uh, I mean, and that increases all these digestive fluids. That makes sense if you're going to put them in your food, that means it's going to augment or enhance your digestive capacity, your ability to break the food down and assimilate the nutrients. So there's a function behind that. And you could also, and then there's also a lot of other things about them that they're very antimicrobial, you know, the garlic, oregano, of course, again, thyme, cinnamon, every spice on your spice rack is filled with antimicrobial compounds. Why is that relevant? A lot of the things that affect us in the microbial world are coming in through our food. They're riding in and hitching a ride in our food. Could be just the, the hands that have contacted them or the conditions of their cooking. But even without that, the food itself, of course, is an invisible microbial world that's always going on with food. And we're always ingesting it. And we have a whole immune system in our gut that is designed to handle that. But when we cook and eat, culinary spices with our food, we're kind of assisting our immune system to not have to deal with it all by itself because they're they're neutralizing microbes in the process of eating it, uh, yeah, of whatever we're eating. Um, there's tons of antioxidants and flavonoids that gives these 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 things like their colors. You know, there's more antioxidants gram for gram in cloves and rosemary and turmeric than anything else we could possibly eat on a regular basis. I mean, you can't eat as much of them, you wouldn't have a bowl full of turmeric for breakfast. But the point is like gram for gram, they're extremely potent. Right. And that antioxidant function translates into all sorts of uh, improved cellular functions and certainly a minimization of inflammatory uh, uh, issues. And that's also a big problem for people because a lot of people's inflammatory patterns, in fact, most start in the gut. And and start you know eroding the membrane and the and the and the linkage of different things in the in the the wall of the the lining of the gut and the mucous membranes. I know you know this, but that's what the, the sort of etiology of leaky gut and then a whole bunch of inflammatory patterns. So ingesting this dosage of anti-inflammatory compounds, antioxidants, antimicrobial, and pungent principles that stimulate and kindle the digestive fire. That's an example of linking a category of medicinal plants to a function. Um, and I explain it in the book in much more detail than that, but that's just a thumbnail sketch of like, okay, so then if you understand that, and then you understand maybe that I'm, what my suggestion is like is to increase and make sure like you're, you're consistently adding culinary spices to your major meals of the day in some form or fashion. And again, Sometimes it could be a recipe that's in the book that's a little complicated and you're like, add, you know, like think about like pho, uh, Vietnamese pho soup or something like that. They put all this Thai basil and uh, all these different types of spices in the broth. And that's a, that's a whole, that's a great example of like, okay, that, that's an intelligent cuisine. They, they, they fig, or the curry, right. they figured it out. But sometimes you're in a pinch and you got nothing. So then there's the black pepper and you just yeah. don't forget about it. You're like, okay, let me add a little bit more. And like, let me experience that like pungency and the action in my gut and, and, and know that I'm getting medicine every time I do this, you know? Hey friends, quick pause in this episode for an exciting announcement. I'm thrilled to let you know that we've officially partnered with Fullscript to create our own very high-end quality supplement store. Fullscript is the number one online dispensary for professional grade supplements. Now, as you probably have realized, the internet is the Wild West when it comes to supplements, and it's tough to find many of the best products from a reliable source and at an affordable price. 
I've heard many stories of people ordering something off Amazon and receive something completely different in the bottle, which can actually be quite dangerous when it comes to nutritional supplements. And so in the BSL Nutrition Full Script Dispensary, we've hand-selected a few dozen of our personal favorites, and we've broken them into easily searchable categories, including Ben's favorites. Now, the best part of this situation is that due to the buying power of groups, we're able to get you a 15% off retail pricing on the entire catalog of professional products in our shop. These are brands like Designs for Health, Biotics, Research, Biobotanical Research, Microbiome Labs, Seeking Health, and more. So just click on the Join BSL Nutrition Supplement Shop in the show notes to create your free account and place your first order. Orders over $50 receive free shipping on top of our 15% discount on everything. And just so you know, the criteria we use to determine what went into the shop is... Is the product something we would recommend and or take ourselves and give to our kids? Is the product of the highest quality? And can we provide a lower cost than is available anywhere else on the web? Now, we sincerely hope this helps you save money and acquire the highest quality products for you and your family. And let's get back to the show. There's obviously a massive learning opportunity for people in terms of what spices they can start to incorporate. I love the the graphics in the book of how you have all the spices like magnetically stuck to, you know, the shelf. Um, I'm assuming it's like magnets, right? Stuck yeah, to yeah. the shelf. So they're in plain eyesight and you can just grab and, and go instead of hidden in the drawers. And I don't know if you know this, but um, the name of my company is Body Systems. And, yeah, I know. And, and so for me, this really hits home because when I was growing up, I had a myriad of of digestive disorders that, you know, Western medicine couldn't figure out, you know, with, with the typical like Pepsid and Zantac and just trying to su- suppress stomach acid. And I was, um, it was pretty painful for me, you know, through high school and into college. And so I kind of had to take it on into my own hands to figure out what was going on, which got me into studying nutrition and started studying functional medicine and started studying supplementation and and is where I really started to associate, okay, the role of some of these herbs in gastric health, you know, talking about aloe and mastic gum and slippery elm and licorice root, right? And right. being able to effectively heal my own gastric disorders and all of the things that my lifestyle had contributed to, right? It wasn't that I was at a deficiency for these, these herbs. It was the fact that I had been on antibiotics literally since I was born. That I was eating crap food, drinking alcohol, you know, not sleeping, like I was a college kid, whatever. But yep. point is that, you know, that definitely um, kind of stimulated my interest in in this realm. And I think that there's so much validity to kind of understanding where we are now in a space where, again, coming back to, I see this massive disconnect. And if there's ways for us because I imagine for the average listener probably feels a bit daunting to kind of think about adding all of these different herbs and spices when frankly, most people don't even cook for themselves very frequently nowadays. And so what I would love to do is address these body systems, right? Address the digestion, the detoxification, the hydration, the nervous system, your core energy system, and and maybe just one or two tips or tools that people could potentially implement right away from a seemingly simplistic approach. Like obviously, you know, what we'll have the link to the plant medicine protocol book in the show notes, but what are a few ways that people can start to make change now in ways that are going to support these body systems? I want to be clear, like in the book and also in my, my approach, I, I make sort of like a, a very clear allowance for the uh, and understanding for the for the fact that we don't live in a, in a world where like like you said everyone's gonna be like cooking a pot of their own homemade you know oh, so or or yeah exactly <laughs> and and frankly neither do i and and, it, and at the same time i don't like express this in the terms of like hacks or something like that either because that doesn't there's a middle ground and it's sort of like you know i have a lot of patients and and 
and clients and people I instruct on this this lifestyle that is kind of I meet them where they are. And so if you're traveling all the time, it's like you can use supplements. You know, you, there's plenty of them out there, and 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 that's fine. It's and and there's trade offs. You know, supplements are more expensive than than a spice rack, but that's fine. They're more convenient. And if you're gonna and and one of the keys is with with like, like I said at the beginning when it comes to the effectiveness of this approach to self-care is that you have to be consistent so it's not like going to work anyway if you only do it sporadically so if, if, it, if it's if it's a mix of sort of simple convenient supplementation and then when you're home you cook with some of this stuff or you you know you make a smoothie and you throw some of the herbs in that or whatever that's fine it's usually a mix and match it's kind of a it's a both and and it really there is no way to get it wrong so i just want to say that from the outset um and also, I would like to say, like what you mentioned before, there's no, it's not a silver bullet approach too. like when you're in clinical practice, when you do what you do, you talk, you know, you're always consulting with people, you realize that like your, your, your success depends on results. And so I, I don't like the approach of in health of, um, or I'll just subscribe to it, the silver bullet, bullet approach to anything, because it's always, always got to be in a context. It's holistic. There's, Everything counts and everything has to be brought into the fold. This is just, this whole thing with medicinal plants is just one more contribution that I think is, is kind of deficient or like absent in a way um, where it could be, you know, in our, in, in sort of like the, the subset of different things people do to stay well. Um, but it's one thing. It's just one additional thing, right. an important one, but it's not like you just do this and it's the end all be all. And I think people should understand that more. I think they are. Um, to answer your other question. So for example, when it comes to digestion, let's start there. And I start there in the book because, and I start there with patients because I think that digestion in Ayurveda is responsible for say 80% of all diseases. They say start in the gut is a saying in Ayurveda, whether it's 80 or not, that the point is it's like they're, they're, they're saying with that saying it's a lot, it's most, um, at least a, a strong core contributing factor. Digestion what I just mentioned in terms of the culinary spices, culinary spices improve what we call Agni in Ayurveda, which is digestive power or fire. And that's an aspect of people experience that when they, when they have like low appetite or bloating or gas, or they get, you know, they're, they're full too off too long, or there's like sluggishness or a lot of mucus. It's often that because the digestive power is not strong enough. And as we age, it tends to like get weaker and dimmer. And there's a lot of factors that weaken it, stress and running around and the wrong diet and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But culinary spices and that category is one of the main remedies I suggest in this book as a way to like kindle that digestive strength and, 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 and restore it. Um, and in that, in that regard, to, for simple recommendations, say like ginger, I talked about it all the time. In Ayurveda, ginger is called the universal medicine because it, it treats almost everything. Like it benefits almost every system of the body, and it's also good for almost any constitution, age, demographic. It's just it's very gentle. Um, so you can get ginger nowadays in so many different forms. You could have ginger shots that they sell, like pre-made at the at the store. Obviously, fresh ginger. There's like dry ginger. There's there's uh, various kinds of ginger tonics and elixirs to drink. There's pickled ginger. There's all kinds of ginger condiments. There's lots of ways to get ginger into the diet. So and of course there's ginger supplements. You know there's like liquid filled, uh, right? Super critical ginger tablets and there's all kinds of stuff like that. So there's no way you can't find ginger. And that's if you were working with just one spice and that, uh, on a regular basis, such as ginger. You're going to see an improvement in your digestive system if you incorporate that into your diet, either prior to eating, like 10, 15 minutes as, a, as an aperitif or a kindler. And that would be like in the case of, say, a ginger shot, you mm -hmm. know, and then you're like, when you have a ginger shot in 10, 15 minutes, you're going to be hungry. And when you eat, you're going to digest better than if you hadn't had that ginger shot because now you got all this blood circulation in your gut or cook with ginger if you're home, if you want to, or if you're out at a restaurant ask for a side of ginger or some pickle ginger and just sprinkle it on your food. Just find a way to get it into your body around your major meals of the day on a regular basis for several weeks, a month, and watch what happens to your digestive mm -hmm. system. It will improve. That's an example. Say like um, detoxification, which I said is the other side of digestion because it's the whole point 
the equation in, in natural medicine is to digest efficiently means we don't have a lot of residue left over that was going to be the basis for inflammation and oxidation and so on and so forth. And we start off by like getting our digestive system working more efficiently, but then we have to always remove waste. That's like what the body's organs of elimination are all about and detoxification. So we can improve those functions mildly on a regular basis. And that's something that the more our organs of elimination and detoxification are working well, the less inflammatory products, byproducts, less lipids and triglycerides and all the things that are like, again, the basis for congestion, and stagnation, inflammation are, are, are irritating the system. So bitter herbs, bitter medicinal plants in various forms have this unique property of stimulating the liver and the gallbladder to pump out more bile and to, and to eject that into the digestive, into the colon, which comes, you know, ends up as uh, elimination as waste as, you know, bowel movement. Um, out comes a lot of other things with the bile. It's like it's, it's, it's essential for digestion in the first place, but also a lot right. of stuff is removed with it. So bitter plants have this unique capacity to stimulate that system to work more efficiently. And there's so many we can incorporate. Dandelion greens was a good one. Like just as something I had that last night, we had braised dandelion greens, just really quick cook, little lemon juice, little olive oil. But I ate a whole bowl of them. You know, and when you go to places like Greece and other Mediterranean countries, they like love those things. They eat tons of them. But you eat like a big bowl of something bitter like that, like chicory or dandelion, or um, even you know like a, a really bitter salad, you know, with like escarole and 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 different kinds of bitter greens, um, like frizzy and and so on. You'll get a lot more liver bile ejected from the from the uh, the system, and that's that's again, it's going to improve digestion. It's going to improve elimination. There are other ones. I, my favorite way to do it, though, is to use bitter liqueurs. And in Italy and other places, a lot of European countries, but other places too, it's common to have a little bitter digestive drink after yeah, a meal. Sure. Right? An Amaro. And, and these things are now like they taste good. They're trendy. They're like sort of an enjoyable thing. But they all have their roots in formulations that were full of medicinal plants that were gathered in the mountains and the farms and the fields. And put together by to, to, for their medicinal effects, to, to cure stomach aches and to improve, like to get rid of acne and, to, and, and, and rheumatism and, and arthritis and skin conditions because there was a recognition that these bitter plants stimulated detoxification. Now, I in my house have a whole wall of bitters from all around the world. And I don't, I'm not recommending like drinking them like you would drink alcohol because you don't need, the alcohol is just a preservative. It's like, but it's all in, in an extracting method. But you just have like a little half a shot glass is all you have to right. have. Barely any alcohol at all. If you want more, it's fine to have a little bit more. But I'm just saying like if you're going to do this on a regular basis, I'm not saying like let's you know drink, drink alcohol three times a day in this big glass or something like that. A little half a shot glass and you just hold it in your mouth and they taste really good and they're very unique. And if you get the right ones, they have these like real interesting bitter and aromatic combinations of plants. And the bitter receptors are in your tongue when they're, when they're stimulated by that bitter flavor, they actually start the process of detoxification right then and there. So it's a great practice and it's a fun practice. And you can do this when you're out at a bar, you know, or a restaurant after the meal, you could say, could you bring me over a little, you know, bitter fernet bronca or like your favorite one, every restaurant, every bar is going to have one. You can get them on liquor stores you can get them online. And if you want to, if, if you're not interested in, in the actual bitter liqueurs, then you can get them as a supplement, you know, in the, in the grocery store. I mean, the supplement aisle and there are uh, different kinds of bitter concoctions that supplement companies make. The point is dandelion, milk thistle, you know, centauri, gentian, there's a whole bunch of bitter plants yep. that in that form are very easy to take. And you can take them in pills if you don't want the alcohol at all. But that would be something I would recommend to do after each meal. At the conclusion of each meal, have a little something bitter. And even if you want, like maybe even a little tiny strong espresso will do the trick, you know, mm -hmm. um, because that really stimulates and, and completes the digestive process. That's another category. So now you got like detoxification and digestion and you and handled. And, you, and it's just a matter of regularity. Should I keep going with a couple more? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I really appreciate the focus on the liver and the gallbladder, because we, we speak with a lot of clients that have, you know, gallbladder. I mean, invariably they have liver issues. They don't realize it, but it's, it's, 
it's uh, manifested often in gallbladder issues, gallbladder removal. And it's like, Hey, there's, there's detoxification issues at play here. Right. Um, like you said, from, from lifestyle factors. So all of the tips that you just gave are awesome. Um, and, and the realizations that I'm making are we utilize a lot of these in supplement form often for clients as well. The, the gentian root and, you know, we'll ox bile and, um, you know, trying to get the, the gallbladder to, to produce more bile and, and, uh, facilitate flow. And, and so I think that's, a, a but just between the digestion and the detoxification, like obviously there, those are huge pathways. Let's just touch on hydration as an easy way for people to improve hydration because everyone's drinking yeah. water anyway. So like, what are right. a couple of things that someone can do just to improve hydration? Like what can they put in their water on a daily basis? And then I want to kind of start to wrap up and share some of the other things that you're up to. I take a fresh aloe leaf. I chop up about maybe a couple inches worth of aloe. I extract the gel. I throw it in this little tiny little hand bl blender. I put in some aloe, uh, some liquid aloe on top of that. Put some chia seeds in there. And then pinch of like uh, sea salt, rock salt, and maybe tiny bit of maple syrup, a little bit of lemon juice. Blend that up. And I drink that every morning. Now, I call it, it's in the book, the recipe of that. But the, the idea here is that one of the first things in the morning, the best time to hydrate, or the, uh, one, of the, one of the most essential times to hydrate. There's not any, there's always a good time to hydrate. But it, that's an essential time to hydrate first thing in the morning. You know, obviously we've been dry, lying in bed, various kinds of temperatures and humidity levels in our rooms. It stimulates the production of new red blood cells. It stimulates the digestive system to get working. It lubricates the intestines and gets the whole, you know, elimination happening. It's a very, it, 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 it gets the brain working properly when we're hydrated first thing in the morning. It's just an important time of the day. And um, so medicinal plants can supercharge hydration in really interesting ways because the ones I, the category is called demulsants. And uh, demulsants are, a whole category of medicinal plants, aloe vera, slippery elm, marshmallow, chia seeds, basil seeds, Jerusalem artichoke, there's many more, Irish moss. They have a mucilage content and, a, or, and or a gel content, really the same thing, made up of complex polysaccharides. And it's a strategy by the plant to hold water and in places where there's dryness or intermittent rain and so on and so forth. We all know what aloe gel is, and it's an ingenious strategy that the aloe plant has created to like absorb and hold on to water. It 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 create it, it uh, holds that water in like a suspended animation. But when we eat that mucilage or gel from these different plants, it it releases the water slowly through our digestive system, as opposed to having it just kind of run right through us. Because we have, it's almost like eating water, and so we slowly absorb it as it moves through the GI tract. And especially the mucous membranes, the mucous membranes of the of the lining the entire GI tract, um, they they benefit greatly from this mucilage because they require, obviously, hydration to do their job, um, and and as a protective barrier for one thing, and also as a way to transfer things to and from the body through the bloodstream. But th it's often dried out and irritated and inflamed. So these these mucilages and gels act as a soother to the, the mucous membranes. It's like a salve that repairs it and heals it, um, accelerates cell generation in the mucous membranes. But this hydration aspect is mo most interesting in the sense that you're drinking like a thickened, more viscous version of water. And some people call it structured water. The, 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 the long and the short of it is, is that it is water that's like tied up in these polysaccharides. And it doesn't just run through like a like um you know kind of like it's running through an hourglass it slowly is absorbed so it's much more hydrating than just drinking water when you drink something like that um the pre the the, the mucilage and the and the, the gels are also superfoods for the book uh, microbiome they're uh excellent source of prebiotic um soluble fiber so that's another major benefit to these things um, a lot of the hydration in our body occurs in the large intestine as it's reabsorbing water from the last of whatever we ate. And so having those 
you know, having a healthy microbiome living there as opposed to something that's kind of like slightly deranged and inflamed also improves our uh, our ability to hydrate because inflammation sucks all the water to it, you know, and, yeah. and essentially like, if, so if your GI tract's inflamed, it's hard to be hydrated in the first place because his body's always like trying to put out the fire. And so most of your good water goes there <laughs> instead of where it should go. So I recommend drinking something like that first thing in the morning. You know, the, the little bit of salt it has the electrolytes, helps you hold on to the water in the first place. Um, but like you can choose it from any of these things, you know, Irish moss, again, marshmallow root, uh, slippery elm. A lot of these things come in powder form. Yeah. Just a little bit yeah, in just, water. Yeah, yeah, you can add them to your water. Of, and, you know, a couple of the ways, uh, like we talked about earlier, I mean, the the goal here is to infuse these things into your lifestyle, right? It's the only way you're going to be consistent with that and understanding that if you're not feeling your best, your lifestyle probably needs to change. And this is a great way to synergize things and to the degree that, you know, even if you started with nothing but waking up and hydrating, like if you're not already waking up and drinking a big glass of water, well, probably would be a good first step. And then can you add a little sea salt and lemon and maybe aloe or, um, you know, maybe some of those powders uh, that, well, that would probably be a logical next step. And then maybe it would be, hey, at what's your bedtime routine look like? And and what are there some teas that we can consume that are going to help wind us down from a nervous system standpoint, from a digestive standpoint, right? I, I think we can agree that you know, you said meet people in the middle and that's where it's, you know, simply taking a look at our existing lifestyle and looking at, you know, we often start with non-negotiables is like, what are the areas? Like, listen, you're, you're going to wake up at a certain time. You're probably going to eat breakfast. Like what's going on in that period of time after you wake up, you know, it's not unreasonable to drink a big glass of water instead of wake up and scroll your phone for 30 minutes. Same thing with a bedtime routine. Everyone suffers from digestion, detoxification, sleep issues. And so establishing some routines around these times becomes paramount, which it's only logical to then see if we can habit stack or stack on some logical components of you know plant medicine in this case to help improve the process. So, right. you know, for those that might be confused around you know, where should I get my supplements? Where should I find these things? Um, if I, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier is when we studied phytonutrients in, in graduate school, you know, we studied these plant compounds and looked at sort of the different parts of the plant that are utilized in the medicinal constituents, in the supplements. And, you know, there's a lot of shady business going on in the supplement industry. It's generally highly unregulated to the degree that how do we know that we're getting what we should be getting, right? If we say, all right, well, you know, we know echinacea is good for something, but how do I know I'm getting a therapeutic dose when I go to Whole Foods and I look at a product that says it has echinacea? Is this something that we should be concerned about? What would you generally recommend people do in these situations? Yeah, I mean that's a great question and it's also it's it's a complicated question in the sense that along with the unregulated nature of a lot of the industry is the unregulated re, unregulated nature of a lot of the information coming from any source re relating to the industry. Um one of the reasons I wrote the book was to offer a source of credible information like that. So you look for you look for credible sources. You look for people who have authentic backgrounds and experience in the field, first of all, and you look at what they've written, you look at what they talk about on these kinds of podcasts and other recordings and things like that. Or you, um, There are certain organizations, the American Botanical Council is an excellent resource for people, um, great website, mo probably the most authoritative website on, online uh, for medicinal plants in terms of research driven, evidence-based, a um, lot, a lot of published data, entry-level kind of like website that people can access if, if they're just, uh, you know, wanting to get some fundamentals. And then there's also like more advanced kind of ways you can subscribe and get like sort of more practitioner level 
you know, access to studies and things like that. Um, there's an organization called the American Herbalist Guild. That's kind of like the accreditation body um, um, that in the United States for professionalism, uh, professional herbal uh, herbalists and so on, herbal practitioners or people who use herbs in their practices, um, uh, even if they're not herbalists only, but different types of alternative medicine practitioners or even nurse practitioners, doctors want to use them. Um, they're all listed in there, lots of resources, lots of recordings. Um, and then in general, then, then you look at certain, uh, you know, of course, I mean, I, I go to things like PubMed. I look at studies that have been done there. I like, try to like really dive in when I'm looking for something like dosage, um, under an understanding of dosage. But primarily, most people's, I think, doorway is also like working with a credible practitioner. There's different levels, for example. Like, you know, if, if, you, if you're looking for to treat a particular kind of illness or dysfunction or chronic problem you've got going on, it's it's appropriate to work with someone who is a professional in the domain, um, in in this case, plant medicine, so that you know you're not sort of just trying to like reinvent the wheel right. in, in that case, right? But if yeah. you're talking about like everyday care, like sort of like how do I improve my digestive system with say culinary spices, like we've been talking about, um, well, that is. One thing about it is that it's it's also just trial and error in a way. You know, you have to, at some level, there's no getting around the need to re-inhabit our body and re-inhabit sort of our, like, our instincts and so on and so forth. And by that, I mean, say that we did that thing where we talked about earlier, trying ginger as like a, as a medicinal plant that you incorporate into your life and into your diet and see how it works for it. Well, you have to kind of pay attention and see like, well, I started it on this day and now two weeks into it, what I say, I'm, what are the changes that have occurred? How am I feeling in relationship to it? How much is too much of it? How much is not enough of it? How much is kind of just right enough for me? And I only say that not as like, we should all just be completely like reliant on like self-experimentation, but we do all have to acknowledge that we have individualized constitutions. And if someone that I'm, that's hearing this says, you know what, ginger makes my stomach hot. And so it's not for me. So what he said about ginger is not going to work. That's true. It probably is. There's, there's plenty of people like that, even though it is called the universal medicine. Mm -hmm. And then it's, and you know, because that's individualized constitution, we're all starting from the same place. And someone might already have like say gastritis or something like that. And you have to like understand your body to an extent and then modify and say, okay, well then for that person, maybe one quarter of the amount of ginger would work the same way for someone else. It's, you know, four times that amount. Or maybe for that person, fresh slice of ginger is different than a ginger shot or so on and so forth. So there's a lot of like variables that are also – because these are bioavailable and non-toxic ingredients, the ones I'm talking about in this book, that's a good place to start because I don't start with supplements. I don't start with like – when I say supplements, I don't consider, say, a ginger shot the same thing as like a standardized sure. dosage of a, sure. of a particular tablet. So I'm still talking about something that's pretty user friendly and really has a wide sort of safety profile and a wide window of like potential like screw ups that aren't going to do any real harm. Whereas if you took a high power standardized supplement of some kind of medicinal plant, you go in there, you're like, I want to detoxify. And you can find on the shelf, if you were to do that in any supplement section of any health food store in the country, a lot of things that are going to mess you up, <laughs> you know. And they might say on the thing, you know, all the claims that you want to hear, oh, it's going to help me detoxify. It's going to improve my liver function. Oh, and it tells you how much to take. And then you do that. That could really imbalance your constitution. and It could screw things up because that's the danger of the supplement industry. Mm, and yeah. that's why I, t I tend to gravitate towards, especially for an extended period of time, when you're talking about the everyday self-care, improve your own wellness level. To stick with the plants and the medicinal plant and, and the and the spices and so on that are like very forgiving and that are part mm. that are, that are, that are clearly part of our ethnobotanical heritage and are still used by people every day, all around the world, as everyday sort of uh, but are, are as like elements of their like normal lifestyle. There, there's no like um, there's no overdosing mo for the most part on the like chamomile. It's pretty pretty hard to do or peppermint, you right. know. 
Yeah, right. some people might not be great for their, they might not like it or they might not be ideal for their constitution, but you're not going to hurt yourself by drinking peppermint yeah. tea. That's for sure. So I stick with that. Also, not just because of its like the safety and the sort of like, but because of what we talked about, the efficacy. I like people not to overlook the power of small things. It's like you, you, most people, we want the most complicated things. You know, it's like we want these crazy hacks and all this stuff. But you know what? Consistent use of chamomile and peppermint tea after a meal to improve your digestion. It's it's very work a day kind of blue collar <laughs> type of way of taking care of yourself. It's not flashy or dramatic, but it works and, and it's and it's not gonna hurt you. So I like to I like people always like what you were talking about too. I think you agree with this. Start with the fundamentals. Get grounded in like the fundamentals of health before we start trying to get too slick because you know our bodies are the same they've been for 150,000 years. You know, it's like physiology is physiology. Yeah. And so that's how yeah, I, I, I like that approach and I think it makes so much sense instead of going out and looking for, again, the the fix, the quick fix from the supplement shelf is like, listen, if there's a way for us to start with real food products that we can infuse into our everyday, you know, as part of changing our lifestyle and supporting these body systems, then that would be a logical, a, a logical step. And, you know, the other thing, and we won't go into this, but you know, in, in the book, you talk about how you, you have this healthcare pyramid and it's not, you know, that the plant medicine isn't the one size fits all, like I said, panacea is there's, there's plenty of room for other elements, including emergency medicine and Western medicine and, you know, natural and functional medicine. And then of course, you know, your, um, plant-based medicine. So tell us, um, obviously like the book is on Amazon. We have the link. So the, the book is called the plant medicine protocol, unlocking the power of plants for optimal health and longevity. So we've got that. Uh, we've got the link to that in the show notes on Amazon. Tell us about your business gold thread. Well, gold thread tonics, um, are, it's a range of plant-based tonics available in stores all around the country. They are plant-based beverages, all only use, using medicinal plants, no sugar, you know, I use monk fruit and a little citrus. And I use these medicinal plants, like the ones we've been talking about all day here or on this podcast and they're all in the book. They're everyday kind of extensions of our diet and our lifestyle. They're biocompatible. And I formulated them in potent doses, you know, meaning there's a, an effect, a functional effect from them and addressing one of these core body systems, generally speaking. So like there's one turmeric radiance that addresses digestion and metabolism and is full of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds and so on, proves digestive fire. Um, and then there's one lavender bliss that's in time for calming the nervous system, winding us down, like you said, proving the sort of tone in the enteric nerves, the sympathetic nervous system, hyperdrive we're all experiencing, calming that down. Um, so each one of these drinks is designed specifically to improve or enhance one of these core physiological systems that I've already said are kind of like the, the, the basis for overall wellness. And I decided I wanted to create something that was like authentic and really did the trick, but tastes good and is available as we were talking about before, where it's like, not everyone's going to cook and, you know, people don't really understand this stuff, you know, in a lot of cases. And it's like, we don't necessarily want someone to have to spend $65 to like as an entry level stab at like what, what plant medicine is all about. So better spend like, you know, three ninety nine and and get a, get a good dose on your lunch break or like after work or before your workout or something like that, you know? And so that, that's been a real success. And I just wanted to have like a real, you know, there's nothing that can get people to understand the power of medicinal plants, like trying them, like physically consuming them. You know, I found that out for, decades it's like you can talk 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 but people after a while are like okay please stop talking and let me taste this thing i want to try it because yeah. there's also you know they're also very novel flavors and they and they make you feel good and they they smell great and, and they and they taste good and, and people you know i think people are also just craving our bodies crave like that like natural stimulation and the, and the way that the compounds and constituents in medicinal plants make us feel in the immediate sense too. That's why we like to have wasabi and ginger when we go out and have like a sushi or, 
you know, like I said, the curry or, or, or the faux spices, it's the spices and, and the other medicinal plants that like make the food exciting and like um, enlivening to us right there in the moment. So I think we, we crave that all the time, you know, and so yeah. it's nice. To, medicinal plants have more of that than anything else I know of when, in terms of what we're eating. Awesome. So we'll have the, so your website's drinkgoldthread.com. We'll have the link in the show notes. I'm lo- I'm just looking it up right now. looks like you guys are in Sprouts stores, a bunch of different stores. Uh, I've got a Sprouts right down the street from my house. So I'm going to go down. Um, oh, I'll send you some. I didn't realize. Oh, dude, okay, just- all good. I, I mean, obviously I'll take you up on that, but I'm going to go grab some anyways and try it out. But this could be a great, uh, you know, a great addition for someone to start to add into their daily routine. It looks like fantastic. I mean, it and, looks and also really well just, done. Thanks. It, it is. It's really, it's taken off. It's very, been very successful. It's been about six years and now they're all, you know, like again, all over the country, Puerto Rico, Alaska. So they've, they've, really, they've really taken hold. And I would say that one of the other things that's my favorite part of the job is like, uh, you know, I have a lot of, as an ethnobotanist, I have a lot of experience with, medicinal plant quality and sourcing. So I, I, I go and I, I, I set up the relationships with the growers, with the people that gather medicinal plants. And I personally ensure that the medicinal plants that are in these things are, are what they say they are, but also that they're potent and that they're, they're the sort of like the best source that's available as far as I can tell on earth. Because I know a lot about this. I know that where things grow makes a big difference. It's the same with foods. It's like the soil, right. the climatic conditions, when it's harvested, how it's processed, how it's stored and shipped. All the things that you have to know about when it's any kind of commodity um, and, and the industry of medicinal plants. Another thing that's important to understand about it is that it, like anything, you know, you can have something warehoused for a year and a half and, and, it, and it might come in and say, hey, this is this is chamomile, but when you, you don't, if you don't know better, it, it's like, well, it's lost all its medicinal value because it's, right. it was improperly. So that's an important feature. I, I try to maintain for sure the quality um, and the standards. Um, everything's brewed. It's not like concentrates. And um, so it's, and it's real, you know, there's, there's 14 grams of herb in every bottle, which means in, in a clinical setting, I might give that to someone to that person, you know, in a, in a clinical encounter. And that's, right. that's the objective. I want them to actually work, not just be that kind of window Amazing. dressing. Awesome, dude. Yeah. Well, you know, you're obviously a wealth of knowledge around this. It, it bleeds through into the book, like I said, which is just an incredible resource that I'm excited to leverage, uh, moving forward with my family for myself. Um, genuinely it it really is a cool a cool cool resource so for those of you listening and i'd strongly encourage you go check out the link and and get the book for yourself uh it's very digestible uh pun intended i suppose in terms (laughs) of the uh you know just the the recipes in there the way that you can start to infuse these herbs and spices and plant compounds into your day-to-day into your meals um and it's not it has a lot in it, but it's not overpowering from a necessarily an information standpoint. It, it seems pretty, pretty applicable for someone that's looking to start to make change. So, Bill, dude, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, for your knowledge. Uh, I appreciate it. And um, I look forward to you know communicating with you further down the road. Thanks a lot, Ben. I really appreciate it. I love your podcast and uh, I will be sending you drinks shortly. Bring it on, dude. I'll take it. Thanks, brother. Talk soon. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. And if you found this content valuable, here are four ways I can help you in your nutrition journey for free. One, grab a free copy of my Fat Loss Fix Guide at fatlossfixguide.com. Two, join my free group at smartnutritionmadesimple.com. Three, Subscribe to my YouTube channel at smartnutritionmadesimpletv.com. Four, leave a five-star rating and positive review so that we can gain access to more nutrition experts ready to share their knowledge with you and ultimately help more people make smart nutrition simple.